Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We have muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the chat window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question and answer portion and I will ask our speaker your questions from the chat window. Your questions in the chat window will only be visible to myself and our speaker. BioPlan Associates presents this four-part educational series sponsored by Bioprocess International, highlighting China's emergence in global biopharma manufacturing trends in the Chinese biopharma industry. This quarterly series uses select content from BioPlan's 2018 second edition report, Advances in Biopharmaceutical Technology in China, a unique peer-reviewed study that incorporates the research and work from over 100 global industry experts, authors, many based in China, including our featured speaker today, Dr. Fai Poon. The market for biopharmaceuticals, supplies, services, and materials in China have expanded rapidly as the government investments, both domestic and international, have focused attention on growing healthcare markets and opportunities in China. The need for peer-reviewed insights into the current and future potential of China is required for the global industry to meet the needs of this rapidly expanding market. In this third webcast, China's GMP strategies dealing with quality management issues to compete with the West, China's biopharma sector faces multiple challenges in quality management, including lack of experience and talent, a rapidly changing regulatory environment, as well as cultural issues in management. In today's featured webcast, we'll cover China's regulatory issues, a review of those current challenges in biopharma quality management in China, and opportunities for progress in this field with the growing CMO platforms and emerging CQO business. I'd like to introduce Dr. Fai Poon, currently the president of Quasel Biotech Limited. He previously worked for Heisen Biopharm, Merck, and Roskamp Institute in the United States. He completed his PhD in biological chemistry at the University of Kentucky and his MBA from the University of South Florida. He has years of experience in the field of biological therapeutics, analytical research, bioinformatics, and proteomics, and more than 10 years of cell culture experience with a focus on biopharmaceutical products. Along with his extensive work background, he has published more than 30 peer-reviewed articles and contributed to more than five book chapters, including Scientific Strategy in China, Moving from Biosimilars to Innovative Drugs, in recently published Advances in Biopharmaceutical Technology in China, second edition. He is currently the managing editor of the Biomedical and Biopharmacology Journal and the associate editor for the journal Chemistry, Biochemistry, and Molecular Biology. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Fai Poon from Quasel Biotechnology. Okay, thank you uh, for the organizer's invitation to uh, give me a chance to, for this webinar. Uh, so today I, I, I'm going to share a little bit about uh, my insight and uh, what we do to really help the scientific strategy in China, uh, particularly in biopharmaceutical industry. Uh, so my, uh, so in, in the introduction, they mentioned about the uh, a second edition of the uh, Advanced in Biopharmaceutical Technology in China, uh, produced by Bioplan Associate, and uh, in there we actually published a paper about the biosimilar scientific strategy in China. Uh, in that paper, we actually get, get into very detail on the uh, re really the three basic uh, scientific uh, platforms that is being used uh, in China. Uh, for example, the uh, bioprocess technology platform, which includes the uh, cell line engineering, cell culture media, upstream process, and downstream process. And of course, uh, we get into uh, detail on the analytical technology as well, such as the uh, primary structure, higher order structure, the functional assay, as well as the purity assay. And we also mentioned the formulation technology. Uh, which include buffering system, uh, uh, antioxidant, and stabilizer. 
and how this is being adjusted in order to create a uh, biosimilar uh, molecule that is similar to the reference product. In 2015, there's a major shift in the biopharmaceutical industry in China. Uh, essentially, a lot of the company are switching from uh, biosimilar to innovative uh, biotechnology. And because of that, um, the bioprocess technology platform, analytical technology platform, and the formulation technology platform, those three main pillars of the scientific strategy in Chinese biopharmaceutical industry really uh, is not sufficient to support all this innovative biologic development. And during that time, a great deal of uh, technology platforms such as face displays, uh, humanized animal model, uh, immunization and humanization, drugability screening, all these technology platforms are being uh, bring in or uh, developed locally within China. And uh, so uh, recently, in 2018 and 2019, uh, Chinese biopharmaceutical company is facing another challenge, which is the large-scale com commercialization. And some of you uh, might heard that in 2019, China, China actually uh, have two approved PD-1 molecules uh, locally. Uh, that created a very large demand on uh, how is a how is the mo biologic molecules is being produced in a large scale commercialization uh, standard. How do we uh, take care of the GMP as well as uh, making sure all the batch are uh, successfully produced? And so uh, earlier this year, we actually published another uh, paper regarding to the challenge that the Chinese biomanufacturing uh, bio is being uh, is facing right now. And we also mentioned in the paper, we also mentioned that the QBD quality by design is a, is a very good way to overcoming the, the challenge that we currently see in Chinese biomanufacturing. And so the challenge that we mentioned in the paper uh, essentially can classify into two categories. Uh, number one is lack of experience, and number two is the immature platform technology. So in the following slides, we gain into uh, more insight into how this two uh, issue is causing the Chinese manufacturing, uh, biomanufacturing, uh, some of the uh, potential problems. And so the first, uh, the first issue that we, we identify is the lack of experience. Uh, so we did a quick survey uh, with uh, a Chinese company and a U.S. company. Uh, what we found is that um, the worker that start, start working in the bioproduction line, uh, mainly the upstream uh, cell culture production line, uh, when a worker starts, uh, working in a U.S. company, um, they usually pre they usually previously have about 1.6 years of experience. So what does that mean? Is when they go into the when a worker he start working in a uh, bioproduction line, uh, usually they have some kind of um, cell culture experience or uh, bioproduction experience in maybe another company or in the, another department. So they usually have 1.6 years of the experience. However, in the Chinese counterpart, uh, in this case, is the Chinese company B. They, uh, the average is about 0 0.3 years, which is about four months. And so, um, so uh, because the Producing, reproducing the large molecule really uh, relies on the ex experienced expert who hands on to uh, uh, in order to produce this molecule. And a lot of time, uh, with the experience to troubleshoot. So uh, the lack of the experience is actually uh, causing some of the Chinese company to to have to uh, find a way to deal with this lack of experience. 
And so the way the Chinese companies do uh, to compensate the lack of experience is that they uh, they actually hire more people to to in in one in their production line. And so we actually uh, do a survey or interview with about four to five company uh, in China and also the multinational company. Uh, some of them are CDMO, some of them are actually biopharmaceutical company. So in the multinational company, uh, the number of staff they require to run a upstream and downstream production line, so the cell culture part as well as the purification part, uh, they usually take uh, need around 10 to uh, 13 people. And uh, that can essentially uh, cover all the all the uh, needs for the workers in, in the production line. But uh, for Chinese company, uh, they usually need more than 25 people in order to cover one single production line. And so the lack of hand-on experience of the work, worker is compensate by more worker to do the same amount of work. Now this actually, uh, uh, there's a plus side and also there's a minus side. Uh, Chinese, because their uh, salary usually is uh, cheaper than the uh, US or uh, Europe. And so uh, increasing the worker actually does not uh, increase their cost of production. But however, with more people working in a production line, they actually cost uh, more of the uh, batch failure rate, uh, more contamination risk, uh, just a human error could be increased. So uh, we estimate that there's about three to six times more uh, batch failure rate than their uh, multinational counterparts in Chinese biopharmaceutical companies. And so the second uh, issue that we identified in the paper was the immature uh, platform technology. So uh, we actually did a survey. We, uh, in, we, we asked 151, some of our clients and some of just associates that we've worked with, and asking them uh, in their projects or the molecules they, they're using, uh, what cell culture system they actually is using. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, the Choke one system from ATCC was the, uh, is the most common used uh, cell, uh, cell uh, mammalian cell platform. And the second one is the uh, CHOAS platform. So, uh, so the, it's not surprising because uh, this two platform cell culture platform uh, uh, commercially is the cheapest. And that's why it is the most common in uh, China. And of course, uh, we see some of the more expensive but more advanced uh, technology platforms such as CHO-SV and CHO-GS. Uh, they are available, but they're not very common. Uh, being, it's not very commonly used being, the China, being used by the Chinese company. Now, while Cho K1 and Cho S is a very good uh, cell, uh, Cho cell platform, uh, what it lacks is that the company cell culture media and process as a platform technology for biomanufacturing. And so, um, what the Chinese company need to do is they need to uh, run a lot of uh, run a lot of experiments in order to develop the media and in order to develop the process. Uh, but one of the issues uh, with that is the Chinese company doesn't really have a lot of uh, molecule have to go through the com commercialization process. So in other words, they don't have a lot of projects to mature their cell culture platform. Uh, so we actually uh, use the same company that we use, uh, US company A and use, uh, Chinese company B in uh, couple slides we used uh, earlier. And as you can see, uh, this, a US uh, company, they actually already have eight molecules to go through their cell culture platform. So um, uh, meaning that they already have eight molecules going from the R&D stage to the commercialization stage. So with eight molecules, they are able to modify and mature the cell, uh, cell culture platform uh, quite advanced. 
But however, the Chinese company only have two molecules have go through from uh, the development stage to the commercializing commercialization stage. Now, two uh, the two molecules that have go through commercialization stage in China actually is already one of the top company. Now, um, but this for the next three or four years will be more and more uh, molecules going through this cell culture platform in China. But the, the point is that uh, still uh, with a lot of company, they just don't have a lot of molecules have been go, uh, have go through the commercial commercialization process. And so uh, in that paper, uh, we conclude that QBD is a very good solution, uh, one of the very good solutions to uh, compensate these two issues that we identify. Uh, the reason being is that QBD can give you a better control strategy during the stage of the uh, design phase identification. And number two, because the improved control strategy, uh, the Chinese workers' lack of biomanufacturing experience can actually be compensated by the, a better control strategy. And because when you identify in the design space, you actually perform a lot of the additional experience, uh, experiments and data to expand the knowledge space. And that can actually help the technology to be, uh, to help the platform technology to be more mature and to develop in a faster space. And so, uh, in course, we kind of ask, ask ourselves, how, what can we do in order to help the uh, cell culture platform or facilitate the maturing of the cell culture platform in China? So uh, we have essentially identified a couple of the, um, I guess, it's the uh, factors that we have to put in in order to uh, create a platform for the customer to use. So uh, technically, uh, this this platform should be used uh, have a high productivity, and also uh, have the vectors, media, and process to go along with the uh, platform. And number two, it has to be have the documentation that that is needed by the Chinese company either for filing for the NMPA or filing for the FDA or EMA uh, internationally. And number three, the components, uh, the price. The Chinese company is extremely price sensitive, and so the price has to be uh, affordable by the Chinese company. And so, uh, essentially, our, uh, we produce uh, someone more, something we call the Cho K1, K1 Q platform. Uh, essentially, it has the uh, pattern of GS vectors technology and the associated monocloning media to accelerate the cell line development, and also the production media uh, that can accelerate um, uh, the process development. Uh, which we uh, recently published in 2019 in the UKS. And uh, numbers, uh, also the platform, we have the uh, bioprocess to associate with this particular uh, cell line. Uh, so from a very small scale, small scale shake flask to a large scale commercialization bioreactor, all these are very easy to scale up as well as scale down. And last but not least, uh, we have a set of the uh, regulatory friendly IND for the wholesale and um, wholesale template for the IND as well as the BLA application. And so uh, the cell actually is, have uh, what we call the complete traceability. Uh, what does that mean is when they first leave the public health of England, uh, the first uh, receive of the dispatch notification, we keep track on the, all the documentation, how they're being shipped from England to China, and then uh, the custom clearance in Beijing for three days, and then go to our laboratory, and, all, and then uh, once again to our uh, laboratory, how we adapt the cell, and then uh, bank it in our GMP uh, facility. So all of this is, uh, have complete have complete documentation to support the traceability. And more importantly, uh, we actually test some of the 
we transplant some of the uh, IgG and fusion protein, and what we found is that they are able to produce and uh, grow in a very uh, well condition. Uh, the highest we saw is they can grow up to 20 million cells per milliliter, and they actually are able to produce 8 gram per liter in some of the IgG project. And more importantly, uh, we show we did experiment to show that uh, we examined the uh, the viable cell density uh, in 45 different passage, as well as the uh, productivity and some of the SDC uh, quality of the protein. And what we found is that uh, after 45 passage, the cell line is still very very stable. And so. Uh, we actually uh, start sending the cell to our customers. And uh, so what we're doing is that we create what we call the Dare to Share Cell Platform, Cell Culture Platform um, program. Uh, what we do is essentially we have five or six biopharmaceutical company uh, to use this platform and form a consortium. And in order to be part of the con 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 consortium, um, they have to uh, share some of the data they uh, obtain from the cell line. And of course, uh, all the proprietary information will be uh, remain proprietary. Uh, but for example, some of the process data and some of the uh, development data, it will be shared among this uh, five or six companies. And uh, once we have uh, accumulated five to eight, ten molecules for this particular cell line, and we're wanting to share this with the uh, uh, biofarm community. So uh, when this information uh, is being used, uh, they can use it as a part of the QBD uh, application, uh, data for the uh, PLA application or the IND application. In that way, it actually helps the company to save a lot of time uh, to develop its own self culture platform. And so we're hoping that using uh, this kind of uh, cell culture platform technology can facilitate and accelerate the cell culture platform development in China. And with that, uh, I've uh, concluded my talk, and I welcome any questions that the uh, audience has. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fai. So the first question is does the CHO K one Q harbor genetic modifications, gene knockout or in or knockout from the parental line? If yes, are there any IP or licensing issues to consider? Uh actually this is a really good question. This is something that uh we consider uh repeatedly within the um within our own organization as well. Uh, we actually decided against using any kind of gene modification, uh, mostly because uh, we don't have a lot of um, I, we don't have a lot of uh, resource to licensing the uh, the knockout technology, and also uh, as soon as we license in the knockout technology, it the price of the product will. I guess it's kind of like a turn off for the um, for the Chinese market. So we decided to do, again uh, we decided to not to use the knockout technology. But uh, even without the knockout technology, our our uh, vector actually is GS based. Uh, so uh, even without the knockout technology, uh, we still able to. Uh, Able to make this uh, engineering uh, cell line with, uh, within about two months, and also the titer is typically in around 46 grams. So uh, we just feel like the, neck, the knockout technology is just not needed. Okay, are there any difficulties in supply chain integrity for companies operating in China, specifically for the media and supplements for the cell culture media? Uh, we we haven't encountered any kind of the issue with the supply chain yet, 
but uh, actually some of our clients' concern is also uh, part of our concerns as well. Because uh, uh, so our clients, we so Quasal actually was in this couple of years actually dis, uh, developed uh, is kind of exceeded our expectation uh, in terms of growth. Uh, the big reason for that was because uh, the trade war between U.S. and China, as well as uh, some of the uh, trade restriction was uh, put in into the uh, cell phone business. So what made the Chinese biopharmaceutical company realize that uh, because of the unstable political issues is currently have is currently happening. Uh, so they realized that they need to at least have a backup, uh, a local company as their backup for critical raw materials such as cell culture media. And so, uh, so for the last couple of years, we actually get a lot of requests to uh, essentially become the either secondary or primary supplier for cell culture media within Chinese company. Now. That being said, is actually we have the same issue uh, for our raw material as well, and so uh, we actually uh, develop a supply chain program. So for each raw material, we have uh, two different sources. Uh, one is uh, outside of the uh, one is uh, what we typically use, and the other one is in uh, within China. Now, of course, this is a long-term process because we can't make all those changes all at once. And so um, uh, we, we're starting this program uh, uh, just one by one of the raw material and try to make sure they have functionally their equivalent. And number two is we have to do all the, because of our GMP uh, system, so we have to make, make sure all our clients knows that we have different kind of the, uh, I guess it's different. Uh, we have, we're changing our raw material, uh, or at least we have another option on the raw material uh, that need, uh, for them to know, for for our clients to know. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Phi. And it looks like that's all the questions we have at the moment. If you still have a question, you're feeling shy, go ahead and type it in, and those will be passed. Oh, great. Straight to Phi. I do actually have one more question. Um, what are the other companies that are in the Dare to Share Cell Culture Consortium? Uh, what are the other companies that are in the... Uh, so I guess the question is, what are the company um, is in the consortium? So, uh, so one of the reasons that uh, they're willing to share the data is that... Um, they, they, uh, we don't disclose who is sharing it. Now, of course, uh, uh, some of the <clears throat> because we actually just just started this program, and so some of the uh, we are still in discussion on how much can we disclose. And so uh, at this point, I rather not disclose any of the company's name. Um, and it looks like we have another question. In general, how would you describe the impact of the trade war on biotech business in relationships? Uh, so the key phase, the key phases in general. Uh, I I don't think I can I can be so I can I don't think I can be in so, so general. But uh, I maybe I can give some of the instant that I. I see that is affecting at least in our company. Number one, we want to purchase several uh, uh, automated uh, workstation, and now it is more expensive because of the uh, tax increase. And so that's one of the one of them is financially um, uh, financially has become a more important burden because uh, because I I come back from U.S. so. Uh, I'm familiar with a lot of product from U.S., so uh, that is kind of my preference of uh, product is from U.S., and so that's one of the uh, issues. And number two, I think uh, it also um, creating a in term of fear, 
that uh, when you're still able to obtain, uh, get some of the product from U.S., uh, that's still okay because uh, pharmaceutical company is still a very high margin uh, uh, industry. So a lot of time it's still okay with 25% increase. But uh, what, uh, what they really worry about is uh, what if they, they put into uh, the specialty, uh, special entity list and you can no longer get some of the material. And so I think that is what major concern that uh, they have for the, I guess, is biopharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical uh, companies in China. Uh, in a way, to kind of accelerate some of the uh, Chinese company to really develop their own technology uh, or working on some of the, the I guess, is the, the technology that we, uh, the Chinese lack. And so I think that is uh, what I see the effect on the biopharmaceutical industry, uh, the trade wall on biopharmaceutical industry. Okay. So we have a couple questions on QED. Um, can you please elaborate on the QED that Quasel has employed to get better control of your process? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so maybe my presentation wasn't very clear. Uh, we, so we actually a cell culture uh, media company. So when we, when, but on my, uh, on my presentation, uh, why I'm saying that the QBD is actually is a very good uh, concept to apply to the bio manufacturing in. Uh, in the biopharmaceutical industry. Now, uh, for Quasla, we actually do use QBD for our manufacturing process as well, but but that's only for uh, our manufacturing process for powder media. Uh, for example, uh, when we, so we actually run it uh, in a very similar manner as the biopharmaceutical industry. So we did a lot of process development for the powder manufacturing uh, we look at um, how many uh, how many the rotation for the pin mills, and then uh, the mix time within the uh, the mixers, and also uh, uh, what's the feeding time. So the raw, how fast the raw material uh, feeding into the uh, pin mill. So all those parameters and their interaction we actually study. For the uh, we actually study when we uh, looking into our bio, uh, looking into our manufacturing uh, process, and uh, we also uh, using that to define our design stage within our process as well. And so uh, that is what kind of QBD we use in our uh, in within in within core cells. Oh, and then and yes. he also asked uh, how to get a better control of the process. Uh, so, uh, so by studying all the parameters, we kind of know that at what point uh, will become the uh, what at what point the process parameter will become uh, critical or will become the the products we, we produce uh, will no longer pass the uh, the the QC, uh, the QC for the Q, will will no longer pass the QC, and so <clears throat> well out of spec, and so uh, with that we essentially control the range of our uh, pro our parameter in a in a stable uh, region so that uh, it can ensure our, pro uh, our product will be uh, will will be produced within the spec. Okay. And would you care to comment on what challenges the Asian biosimilars market is facing right now? Uh, for biosimilar uh, in Asia market, um, I think for for so so we actually work on so I previously actually uh, work on the bio uh, biosimilar market uh, biosimilar industry. 
for the last several years. Uh, what I see is for the Asian market, uh, it's actually uh, quite a diverse uh, market. And from the regulatory, I think from the technical, technical standpoint, I don't think there's much uh, differences. But uh, I think the most challenging thing will be the regulatory. Because uh, when I look at uh, Asia, I actually divide it into uh, Japan and Korea, which is a, to me, is a highly regulated uh, market. And then you have China and India, uh, which is what I call uh, semi-regulated. But with the, chi with, with the China uh, regulatory, is actually getting closer and closer to the U.S. and the EMA. And then you have the... Um, <clears throat> You have the uh, what I call the less regulated, uh, such as Bangladesh and uh, Pakistan. Uh, those countries essentially uh, have a very loose um, regulatory uh, requirement for the biosimilar. And then you have some uh, uh, someone uh, the Southeast Asia, uh, the Asiana uh, region, such as Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia. So all this uh, essentially follow exactly like the EMA requirement, and that actually make it more difficult to get uh, cheaper medicine to those regions. So uh, when a biosimilar company, when you want to go into uh, Asia uh, market, uh, you actually have to deal with different kind of regulation, which is quite drastically different than each other. And so uh, I think it just takes some time to really uh, understand the regulatory requirements for biosimilar for different countries. Okay. So thank you, Phi, for all those answers, and thank you to our audience for your questions and your attentiveness. Um, again, if you have follow-up questions, um, you can add them here now, and we'll pass those on to Fi. This webcast was recorded, and you'll receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link to the recording. We thank you for joining us for this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. There is another webcast in our series in September, so look for those announcements in your inbox. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.